Chapter 10 Dickon The sun shone down for nearly a week on the secret garden. The secret garden was what Mary called it when she was thinking of it. She liked the name, and she liked still more the feeling that when its beautiful old walls shut her in, no one knew where she was. It seemed almost like being shut out of the world in some fairy place. The few books she had read and liked had been fairy story books, and she had read of secret gardens in some of the stories. Sometimes people went to sleep in them for a hundred years, which she had thought must be rather stupid. She had no intention of going to sleep, and, in fact, she was becoming wider awake every day which passed at Misselthwaite. She was beginning to like to be out of doors. She no longer hated the wind, but enjoyed it. She could run faster and longer, and she could skip up to a hundred. The bulbs in the secret garden must have been much astonished. Such nice clear places were made round them that they had all the breathing space they wanted, and really, if Mistress Mary had known it, they began to cheer up under the dark earth and work tremendously. The sun could get at them and warm them, and when the rain came down it could reach them at once, so they began to feel very much alive. Mary was an odd, determined little person, and now she had something interesting to be determined about. She was very much absorbed indeed. She worked and dug and pulled up weeds steadily, only becoming more pleased with her work every hour instead of tiring of it. It seemed to her like a fascinating sort of play. She found many more of the sprouting pale green points that she had ever hoped to find. They seemed to be starting up everywhere, and each day she was sure she found tiny new ones, some so tiny that they barely peeped above the earth. There were so many that she remembered what Martha had said about the snowdrops by the thousands, and about bulbs spreading and making new ones. These had been left to themselves for ten years, and perhaps they had spread, like the snowdrops, into thousands. She wondered how long it would be before they showed that they were flowers. Sometimes she stopped digging to look at the garden, and tried to imagine what it would be like when it was covered with thousands of lovely things in bloom. During that week of sunshine, she became more intimate with Ben Weatherstaff. She surprised him several times by seeming to start up beside him, as if she sprang out of the earth. The truth was that she was afraid that he would pick up his tools and go away if he saw her coming, so she always walked toward him as silently as possible. But in fact he did not object to her as strongly as he had at first. Perhaps he was secretly rather flattered by her evident desire for his elderly company. Then, also, she was more civil than she had been. He did not know that when she first saw him, she spoke to him as she would have spoken to a native, and had not known that a cross, sturdy old Yorkshire man was not accustomed to salaam to his masters, and be merely commanded by them to do things. Thart liked the robin, he said to her one morning, when he lifted his head and saw her standing by him. I never knows when I shall see thee, or which side thou come from. He's friends with me now, said Mary. That's like him, snapped Ben Weatherstaff, making up to the women folk just for vanity and flightiness. There's nothing he wouldn't do for the sake of showing off and flirting his tail feathers. He's as full of pride as an egg's full of meat. He very seldom talked much and sometimes did not even answer Mary's questions, except by a grunt. But this morning he said more than usual. He stood up and rested one hobnailed boot on the top of his spade while he looked her over. "'How long has thou been here?' he jerked out. "'I think it's about a month,' she answered. "'Thou's beginning to do Misselthwaite credit,' he said. "'Thou's a bit fatter than thou was, and thou's not quite so yeller. Thou looked like a young plucked crow when thou first came into this garden. Thinks I to myself, I never set eyes on an uglier, sourer-faced young un. Mary was not vain, and as she had never thought much of her looks, she was not greatly disturbed. "'I know I'm fatter,' she said. "'My stockings are getting tighter. They used to make wrinkles. There's the robin, Ben Weatherstaff. There indeed was the robin, and she thought he looked nicer than ever. His red waistcoat was as glossy as satin, and he flirted his wings and tail, and tilted his head and hopped about with all sorts of lively graces. He seemed determined to make Ben Weatherstaff admire him, but Ben was sarcastic.' "'Aye, there thou art,' he said. "'Thou can put up with me for a bit sometimes when thou's got no one better. "'Thou's been reddening up thy waistcoat and polishing thy feathers this two weeks. "'I know what thou's up to. 
thus courting some bold young madame somewhere tellin thy lies to her about being the finest cock robin on missile moor and ready to fight all the rest of em oh look at him exclaimed mary the robin was evidently in a fascinating bold mood he hopped closer and closer and looked at ben weatherstaff more and more engagingly he flew on to the nearest currant bush and tilted his head and sang a little song right at him thou thinks thou will get over me by doing that said ben wrinkling his face up in such a way that mary felt sure he was trying not to look pleased thou thinks no one can stand out against thee that's what thou that thinks the robin spread his wings mary could scarcely believe her eyes he flew right up to the handle of ben weatherstaff's spade and alighted on the top of it then the old man's face wrinkled itself slowly into a new expression he stood still as if he were afraid to breathe as if he would not have stirred for the world lest his robin should start away he spoke quite in a whisper well i'm danged he said as softly as if he were saying something quite different thou does know how to get at a chap thou does thou's fair unearthly thou's so knowin and he stood without stirring almost without drawing his breath until the robin gave another flirt to his wings and flew away then he stood looking at the handle of the spade as if there might be magic in it and then he began to dig away and said nothing for several minutes but because he kept breaking into a slow grin now and then mary was not afraid to talk to him have you a garden of your own she asked no i'm bachelder and lodge with martin at the gate if you had one said mary what would you plant cabbages and taters and onions but if you wanted to make a flower garden persisted mary what would you plant bulbs and sweet-smelling things but mostly roses mary's face lighted up do you like roses she said ben weatherstaff rooted up a weed and threw it aside before he answered well yes i do i was learned that by a young lady i was gardener to she had a lot in a place she was fond of and she loved em like they was children or robins i've seen her bend over and kiss em he dragged out another weed and scowled at it that were as much as ten year ago where is she now asked mary much interested heaven he answered and drove his spade deep into the soil according to what parson says what happened to the roses mary asked again more interested than ever they was left to themselves mary was becoming quite excited did they quite die do roses quite die when they are left to themselves she ventured well i'd got to like em and i liked her and she liked em ben weatherstaff admitted reluctantly once or twice a year i'd go and work at em a bit prune em and dig em about the roots they run wild but they was in rich soil so some of em lived when they have no leaves and look grey and brown and dry how can you tell whether they are dead or alive inquired mary wait till the spring gets at em wait till the sun shines on the rain and the rain falls on the sunshine and then thou find out how how cried mary forgetting to be careful look along the twigs and branches and if thou see a bit of a brown lump swellin here and there watch it after the warm rain and see what happens he stopped suddenly and looked curiously at her eager face why dost thou care so much about roses and such all of a sudden he demanded mistress mary felt her face grow red she was almost afraid to answer i i want to play that that i have a garden of my own she stammered i there is nothing for me to do i have nothing and no one well said ben weatherstaff slowly as he watched her that's true that hasn't he said it in such an odd way that mary wondered if he was actually a little sorry for her she had never felt sorry for herself she had only felt tired and cross because she disliked people and things so much but now the world seemed to be changing and getting nicer if no one found out about the secret garden she should enjoy herself always she stayed with him for ten or fifteen minutes longer and asked him as many questions as she dared he answered every one of them in his queer grunting way and he did not seem really cross and did not pick up his spade and leave her he said something about roses just as she was going away and it reminded her of the ones he had said he had been fond of do you go and see those other roses now she asked not been this year my rheumatics has made me too stiff in the joints he said it in his grumbling voice and then quite suddenly he seemed to get angry with her though she did not see why he should 
Now look here, he said sharply. Don't thou ask so many questions. Thou art the worst wench for asking questions I've ever come across. Get thee gone and play thee. I've done talking for to-day. And he said it so crossly that she knew there was not the least use in staying another minute. She went skipping slowly down the outside walk, thinking him over and saying to herself that, queer as it was, here was another person whom she liked in spite of his crossness. She liked old Ben Weatherstaff. Yes, she did like him. She always wanted to try to make him talk to her. Also, she began to believe that he knew everything in the world about flowers. There was a laurel-hedged walk which curved round the secret garden, and ended at a gate which opened into a wood in the park. She thought she would slip round this walk and look into the wood, and see if there were any rabbits hopping about. She enjoyed the skipping very much, and when she reached the little gate, she opened it and went through, because she heard a low, peculiar whistling sound, and wanted to find out what it was.